It's my pleasure to um, invite uh, Dr. Sashadri to talk from UC San Antonio. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to first thank Tamist for inviting me. I'd also like to thank UT Health San Antonio for recruiting me a year ago to establish a Biggs Institute of Alzheimer's and my colleagues there, some of whom are here. And finally, the participants and colleagues at the Framingham Heart Study, now celebrating its 70th year, where the last 25 years my research has been in population neuroscience. I have no conflicts and want to acknowledge NIH funding. I'm going to speak briefly about the challenge of dementia, which we all know, and how this plays into the philosophy of the Biggs Institute. I was asked today to describe it, so a little bit of it will be description rather than science, and then talk briefly about my perspective on what the genetics of late-onset Alzheimer's disease show in terms of clues to novel biology and prevention of dementia. Today in the US, there are about 6 million people living with the disease, about 400,000 of whom are Texan. About one in three of us in the room will die with a dementia if nothing is done about it. It's the only one of the top 10 causes of death that's going up rather than down. And it costs our country nearly $300 billion each year. So one of the... Um, and in Texas, if you include both the direct costs and the caregiver burden, it's over $40 billion. One reason is that Texas has about 40% Hispanics versus 20% in the rest of the country. And among Hispanics, the rate of Alzheimer's disease, the risk seems about 40% higher. Caregiving burden is greater, but this is a group that's not well studied. And if unchecked, by 2050, the burden will triple overall, but will be six times as great in Hispanics. Another challenge, as you just heard, is that dementia is heterogeneous. This is some data from the Religious Order Study. And you see, if you assess cognition every year in a group of people, and then look at the pathology in their brain when they die, people who have dementia when they die and people who are normal when they die, both have some degree of Alzheimer's pathology that's blocks and tangles sufficient to make a pathological diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. One thing that is very different between the groups is the numbers of other pathology, including TDP43, sclerosis, microinfarcts, things like that. This may be part of the reason why drug trials have failed. One size fits all doesn't work. And how can we then understand the underlying mechanisms? Probably by endophenotypes like MRI and PET, but endophenotypes also include a clinical neurological exam, a cognitive assessment profile. And so with this philosophy, we established the Biggs Institute last year, mostly with philanthropic funding, as having five co-equal cores clinical care closely integrated with research, a strong basic science core building on aging research and with a computational innovative core, a population neuroscience and public health epidemiology core, of course, education and training, and community engagement and advocacy. We've had a wonderful first year, and while we are Within walking distance, the different components of these five cores, including the cyclotron being within two minutes of the clinical um, space, we hope to have a freestanding building linked to both the clinical as well as the research endeavors. The core of this, I believe, is wonderful care because we would like to still be here 70 years from now. And the way to build this loyalty is clearly a team effort among physicians and other providers. For example, some initiatives 
would be a healthy brain where people receive individualized assessment of their risk for dementia and a, tre a treatment plan or a prevention plan, a mind clinic where the neurologist, Dr. Parker, and a neuropsychologist and a social worker see the people, person on the same day to hasten diagnosis, a comprehensive care for persons with dementia clinic for moderate to severe dementia, where on the same day a person could see a psychiatrist, a neurologist, a geriatric palliative care, social work and occupational therapy if they need to, linked to primary care centers and are building links to the uh, border regions. And for everybody, getting a universal consent for data and biosample storage and clinical research efforts. For instance, I'm sure there's a timer there. For instance, here, Dr. Parker and Gonzalez, in their first year as faculty, have TAR grants to look at diastolic heart function, the type of cardiac dysfunction more common in women with relation to brain dysfunction, and blood biomarkers for dementia. We're also building a common portal for recruitment into drug trials, for prevention, for mild AD, and for behavioral symptoms. We have a robust caring for the caregiver program. Just last week, it included support groups and dialogues, and a lay advisory board so that we can learn from the participants and from the patients uh, and caregivers as well. And we've established a brain donation program, free to people focusing on South Texas, but willing to um, collect brains from anywhere in the country free to the family, as well as links to other brain banks. And here are Dr. Bianek, Dr. Walker, and Vasquez at 2 a.m. in the morning, one cold November day, to minimize the postmortem delay in freezing the brain. And here are some examples from our biological core. Dr. Frost will be speaking later tomorrow. But here is some work from Dr. Orr showing that senescent cells can result in injury to adjacent neurons, enlargement of the ventricles, treating with senolytics prevents this to some extent. And this paper was published this year, and already she has pilot funds and IRB approval to start recruiting towards a phase one and two in humans. So what are some of the genetic clues this has been one of the areas that I've been studying. And I'm going to back up a minute because the focus of the study was Framingham, where starting in 1948, three generations of participants have been recruited with a brain bank and with MRI, and since 2015 with PET imaging as well as multiomics. The MRI can be read in many ways, including in terms of the connectome. Recently, the NEJM emphasized looking at connectomes rather than regions. And 15,000 people is a small sample for genetic discovery outside families. So multiple consortia for the last 10 years have come together as a charge consortium, which is which, where I lead the neurology working group. So the BIGS now leads the neurology working group. And the next meeting is at Washington University, St. Louis. And this, along with other consortia, as you heard today, consortia of consortia, have identified a number of common variants as well as rare variants pointing to new pathology. It's not all about the neurons and astroglia. BIN1, for instance, is differentially expressed in oligodendroglia and TREM2 in microglia. We also find this is a recent study looking at rare variants in exonic rare variants and pointing to immune response. And more recent work looking at whole genome sequencing, here Chloe Sarnowski found that using, you know, only 2% of a genome is exonic and the remaining 98% we need to study. And here you're using sliding windows and finding that glucocerebrosidase that's associated with Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies is also associated with white matter hyperintensity. One clue suggesting an overlap between vascular and Alzheimer mechanisms. One disadvantage of sequencing is cost. So using a cheaper exome chip, instead of 2,000 people, you study 38,000 people and find an abnormality in a mitochondrial protein gene, 
and mitochondrial disease is being studied, mitochondrial genetic variation by my colleague, Dr. Satizabal. We have another project where the enduring mystery of how APOE2 increases or protects is being explored by Dr. Jean Linhan with a lipidomic and sulfatide perspective. So this is the kind of research. Two of his aims are on animal models, one in human brain tissue that having an integrated institute should help us do. Going downstream from genetics, if you look at gene expression, here Framingham data transcriptome to white matter hyperintensity, you find the gene tremel too, again showing an overlap. Here looking at metabolites even further downstream, this can tell us perhaps how these kind of Lifestyle factors may be biologically protecting against Alzheimer's. Fish intake increases metabolites that seem to improve cognition. Smoking increases metabolites that seem to decrease cognition. And at the BICS, working with Dr. Sharma, we are beginning to look at spatial metabolomics in brain slices. Where does this go into prevention? Uh, paper in The Lancet suggested that there are factors at different stages of life. Education early on, vascular in midlife, and late life factors. And I had the privilege of being on this National Academy consensus report where we looked at a range of trials and unfortunately, no intervention was proven. Three interventions were promising managing your blood pressure, physical activity, though we still don't know how much or what type. For instance, physical activity less than what you need for heart might be sufficient, and cognitive enrichment. Again, we need to work out what type, how much, when. But some of these factors, such as sleep and stress, are emerging and just didn't have enough data. Doesn't mean that they cannot be risk factors or protective factors. For instance, recently we looked at Framingham data, early morning cortisol associated with smaller gray matter, worse cognition, changes in white matter, and this wasn't just due to depression. As you can imagine, this generated a lot of popular attention. And the question that came up, how do we risk stratify people to look at them in more detail? And we need simple tests. There were earlier data from Framingham suggesting that walking speed could be a predictor of dementia. Slower walking speed, one standard deviation, doubled your risk of developing dementia. And here, Dr. Jacob and with colleagues, engineering colleagues, um, have a small camera at the end of the corridor where using which you can kind of look at more subtle gait measures. The one hopeful message is that data from Framingham and a large number of high-income countries suggest that there is, in fact, something we are doing right. Here you find that over 30 years, the risk of dementia at a given age went down about 40%, and the mean age at which symptoms began went up about five years, which can halve population burden. But we don't exactly know what we are doing. We looked at all the usual vascular risk factors, and this explained less than 10% of the decline. When you don't know what you're doing right, it could go the other way too. And I do want to point out that there's no data on trends in Hispanics and Native Americans, and what data there are in African Americans from Chicago suggests there is no decline there. So these are important questions to address. Again, some of these issues like amyloid and tau burden, we don't know what is the prevalence in Hispanic populations. We, the male population is mostly white, so this data is just emerging. So the San Antonio Heart and Family Heart Studies were initiated about 40 years ago with oversampling of lower socioeconomic status. They have excellent metabolic data, which we know increases the risk of dementia, and over the years there has been further study with um, with uh, 
the salsa study as part of TARC, as well as in 863 people with detailed MR and whole genome sequencing. And some of these people are going to be brought back, as well as through this MARC VCID, about 200 people will have MR, eye, and uh, other blood biomarkers assessed. So we are a very collaborative group, and we welcome collaborations. Join us in February or reach out to any one of us today. I'd like to end by thanking some of the collaborators. Here are the Biggs Group at the Alzheimer Walk. Here are the Charge colleagues at the meeting in Boston that we organized, some of our Framingham colleagues and IGAC colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Yes. We have time for questions. So um, there is a question I would like to ask, uh, if that's all right. It um, follows up on what, um, how Cliff Jack was responding, which is that we can find these lifestyle interventions or lifestyle factors that one might say reduce the risk of Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, how do you think they work? So um, do you think they're going to work by modifying the progression of the disease itself, that is, you know, buildup of tau, amyloid, and whatever? Or are they working by increasing resilience and increasing the cognitive reserve that people have so they're better able to withstand the, um, the attack, if you like, of the pathological um, check burden? I think there are, of course, a number of factors, what we call traditionally vascular, metabolic, lifestyle, and the answer is likely to be a little bit of all of the above. For instance, earlier this year, we had a paper where we showed that if you have an APOE4 gene or a SOL1 gene variant, and you have high triglyceride levels in midlife, that increased your risk of Alzheimer's disease, a gene-environment yep. interaction. For, I, I think we are in the initial phase of understanding the mechanisms. Um, clearly, our understanding will deepen as we combine clinical biomarker data. Frankly, at some level, if I'm 90 years old and I have amyloid in the brain, but I'm playing bridge, I don't care. And so it's important to understand resilience factors as well. And some of these amyloid positive, tau positive, are not as clear cut because uh, for tau, for instance, the ideal tracer is still being developed. And for amyloid, for instance, there is a continuous variation that increases with age. And finally, even pathologically, we have a BRAC 1 and 2 where we say they probably don't have AD. We have a 5 and 6 where they say neuropathologically they probably have AD. But we have a BRAC 3 and 4 where it is a challenge. You need to put it together. But I think a combination of um, looking at the underlying biology with whatever tools we have and studying the risk factors in detail. Exercise is not exercise is not exercise. Um, they, are, they can be different types. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.